in San Francisco. I began my career with the city in 1987 and have worked on site at the Moscone Center since 1990. I, was, I served first as the department's deputy director, then I was promoted to director in 2004. For the past 31 years, it has been my honor to serve and to represent the Asian American community in my leadership role at Moscone. I am fortunate to have had the privilege of working with the Japanese American community in a variety of capacities over the years. As third generation Japanese Americans, it has always been important to my wife and I to encourage our kids to recognize and embrace their Japanese heritage. With each passing generation, we seem to lose sight of where we came from and the struggles our ancestors endured so that we today would have opportunities that we otherwise would not. It is during APA Heritage Month that I am reminded to reflect on how fortunate we are to be able to raise a family in a city as amazing and diverse as San Francisco. Today's celebration of APA Heritage Month is a product of the ongoing work that the city administrator's office has been doing around racial equity. The program will feature experiences and, and perspectives of two amazing Asian American leaders in their field. We all know our very own city administrator, Carmen Chu. A daughter of Chinese immigrants, Carmen has served in her role as city administrator since February, prior to which she served as an elected leader here in San Francisco for well over a decade. Whether in her time as the assessor or on the board of supervisors, Carmen has put accessibility to government, especially for our immigrant and underserved communities at the forefront of her leadership approach. Please welcome our city administrator, Carmen Chu, to give opening remarks and to introduce our special guest speaker. Hello everyone, and of course, thank you very much, John, for the warm introduction, and of course, for all of your years of service. Uh, before uh, starting in this role, I worked often with John actually in the Japanese American community in Japantown to make sure that we're continuing to preserve the culture and heritage of our communities. And so I wanna thank John for all the work he does, not only at Moscone, but also in the community at large. Thank you, John. Um, today, you know, I want to first thank you all for joining us for APA Heritage Month. Uh, as John had mentioned, we in the city administrator's office have put together a series of these events to really highlight and uplift the voices and experiences of our diverse communities. Uh, as we start to think about our APA Heritage Month, one of the things that was really important to me was to bring to you um, the different perspective about how um, our AAPA community has been represented and no better person than to bring Debbie forward uh, today. I'm going to go into a little bit of her background and uh, story in just a minute, but I think just in my mind, you know, when we think about kind of the importance of, of uh, months like APA Heritage Month, it's oftentimes we will focus on celebrating the culture, the dance, the song, the art, the food of our communities to be able to share in the diversity and richness that we have um, in, in all of our communities. But I think one of the more important things also is that it's an opportunity for us to uplift the voices and to share some of the experiences that we've all been um, seeing. I think especially this year, you know, we've had a lot of conversation around the hate uh, that we see in the Asian American community or anti-Asian American community um, hate. And so I think one of the things that really is apparent to me is the importance for us to continue to share that it's not that this is the first year that we've had um, these experiences. This is not going to be, um, it's not the first time that our community has faced discrimination. Um, nor has been the center of attacks for whatever reason. Um, and I think that it's important for us to just recognize that when we talk about AP Heritage Month, you know, even the, the calling the month AP Heritage Month also forgets that, sometimes forgets that our APA community is not monolithic. And I, I hope that Debbie will be able to share some of those pieces too. But within the APA community, we have immigrants and we also have people who are refugees from countries and we have people who have been in the United States for generations upon generations. We have people who have a very different experience with regards to income and security and housing, even in our own community and in San Francisco in the Bay Area. We have people who are able to access services uh, without much assistance and others who do need language help too. And it's not just Chinese American, right? It's Korean, Vietnamese, 
to gel, Thai, Filipino, so many different communities that are part of our Asian American community. And so I think it's it's a complex story to tell and it's a very complicated um, uh, uh, celebration, so to speak, because we have so many different cultures to be able to highlight here. Um, in my own experience, you know, one of the things that I hope to highlight is that, you know, I, I think Debbie has much to tell us in terms of the stories that she can tell, but, you know, I, I come from a family of immigrants and I can share with you that regardless of what generation you are in, um, there is always a fear that you will be in this community of perpetually immigrants, um, perpetual foreigners in this country. There's a question about how do we exist in in the the culture that we have here? There's always a tension with our model minority status in in the United States, and I think that Debbie will speak a lot to some of the the stories that she's been able to highlight and tell uh, through some of her documentaries. And so I think as we begin and we start to uh, close out the month of APA Heritage Month, I really hope that you'll be able to see that storytelling is one way that we can begin to dispel some of these stereotypes of our APA community and be able to really show the complexity uh, of our experiences and some of the challenges that we face as a community. And so I think that's why inviting someone, a woman who has dedicated her whole life to storytelling, um, is is such a joy and such a pleasure. And so today I'm excited to bring to you uh, Debbie Lum, who is an award-winning filmmaker. Um, she Her projects give voice to the Asian American experience and to rarely told stories, frankly. Um, she recently uh, completed a documentary called Try Harder. Uh, I just watched it actually, and it's just an amazing story about um, our one of the most iconic um, high schools that we have in San Francisco, Lowell High School. Um, it premiered at the 2021 Sundance Film Festival. And in her previous documentary, Seeking Asian Female, it premiered at South by Southwest and was a fan favorite on PBS Independent Lens. It also won Best of Fest and Outstanding Director at the LA Asian Pacific Film Festival and was also featured in This American Life. And so we are so, so, so thrilled to hear from Debbie today and, of course, are a little bit more than starstruck to have her join us uh, in this forum. So welcome, Debbie. So, I'm, so gonna, much. I'm gonna get started with a few questions right off the bat. And so I think first and foremost, um, being a filmmaker, it's not a traditional, necessarily a traditional field that we can think of. And that is also part of a stereotype. And I think one of the things I, I'd like to hear more about, and I'm sure that folks would too, you know, how did you get into documentary filmmaking? And what was it about your background that inspired you to create not only films, but documentaries? Yeah, thank you so much, Carmen. That was an, um, a, a lovely introduction. And I loved hearing your thoughts about this month in our community and all the work that you've done. It's amazing. Um, yeah, so I have always wanted to make films since I was a kid. I grew up watching, you know, we actually, I, I did not have the fortune of living, growing up in San Francisco, which I always say is sort of like Mecca for Asian Americans, <laughs> or at least our family thought of it that way. Um, I'm like fourth or fifth generation on my father's side. His family is from Hawaii and my mom grew up in New York City. Um, and, you know, for some reason we were, we were raised in St. Louis, Missouri in the heartland. Um, but we always kind of looked to San Francisco as this place, um, that was, you know, a place where Asian Americans had, had more of a home. Um, and so, um, I grew up behind the Creep Course cinema, you know, in the <laughs> Star Wars blockbuster generation. And I just like, I loved films. Um, from a, a young age, and I always never thought that I I couldn't make films. My parents, um, you know, a lot of my friends were children of immigrants. You know, yeah. my best friends. Um, you know, the one or two other families in St. Louis, Missouri, that were Asian yeah. were Korean American. Yeah, recent immigrants, and um, I, my parents, like they had done all the rebelling, so they <laughs> wanted their kids to be artists. You know. And like I was joking with you before, my sister, who's a surgeon, is the one who rebelled. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I, I can't. I can't even imagine. My my parents also never envisioned politics for me, for example, because you know I remember when I was first even in in the 
when uh, Gavin Newsom at the time, who was mayor of San Francisco, had asked if I would step into the role, I remember thinking about it over a, an evening, and my parents were just like, are you sure you want to do this? And it was, you know, it was a very, uh, it was not like, this is a great opportunity. It was, a, it was just a lot of worry on their part about being in public life, which wasn't something that they necessarily wanted uh, for me. And so I can imagine uh, some of the challenges that, that folks have. But I, I want to hear a little bit more because what, what was it in your background that, that you know, you, you were behind the theaters and kind of grew up loving film, but, but you also chose not to just make films, but to really focus on, on telling stories of people's lives and, and working on documentaries. What was it about that that really attracted you to that, to that profession or that, that focus? Yeah, well, every single film that I have directed, produced, edited, I worked as an editor for a long time or, or worked on, it's always been a film about the Asian American experience. And um, I feel like I always want to make stories that are tell stories that are original and not haven't been told. And, you know, you could drop a, a, you know, you could throw, I mean, you can, there's so many thousands of stories about the Asian American experience that haven't been told and are original that we don't know about. Yeah. Um, so that, that is one thing. Um, and um, I started out making, I, the first film I ever worked on was the Joy Luck Club, which is really <laughs> nice. um, And it actually started out up here in, in Berkeley in the fantasy studios. You know, there's a very Bay Area origin working with Wayne Wang and um, Amy Tan, obviously the author. Um, but um, it moved down to Hollywood in the middle. I always thought I was going to work in fiction, yeah. um, but I could see kind of like the glimpse of like the Me Too problem in Hollywood. And so... Um, I wanted to do something that was more authentic. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what doc, what brought me into documentary mm -hmm. filmmaking. Got it. What, what, tell me a little bit about your latest documentary and it, it's Try Harder and this uh, premiered at the Sundance uh, Festival recently. And um, it's actually going to be shown at opening night or was shown at opening night at the Cannes Festival, which is the Center for Asian American Media uh, Film Festival. And it's about the high school students at Lowell and kind of what they have been going through. So, tell us a little bit about that that process and why, how did you choose that topic? Yeah, you know, well, Lowell High School needs no introduction, um, but um, I started out making or researching and developing a film called My Tiger Mom. You know, I'm a mom and I have like, uh, um, you know, at the time that I started the film, my oldest was just entering kindergarten or pre-K actually. And I found myself like surrounded by parents who were freaking out about how to get their kid um, to Harvard, into Harvard when they're like three years old. And like <laughs> the competition for getting into, you know, pre-K um, was intense. And I just wanted to explore this sort of um, stereotype of the tiger mother. Um, my films have always, I, I really like delving into the stereotypes and then finding out all the nuances and all the the humor and the and the the grays that are left out of the black and white um, media headlines. And so um, I was exploring, you know, what from a parent's perspective, especially a mom's perspective, like why we push so hard for um, the success of our, our children in, in education. And Lowell High School was going to be one chapter in that story. Mm -hmm. um, and the minute that we met, um, we started talking to the students and, you know, we met one of the teachers there, the AP physics teacher, Mr. Yeah. Shapiro, yeah. Um, we just fell in love with the kids. Um, it wasn't anything like I thought it was going to be, you know, I mean, we had heard, I mean, I, I'm an outsider, you know, obviously if you grow, you know, like if you're from here, Lowell is, is um, famous and, and infamous. And a lot of people talk about these like com really super competitive um, academic drones that go to Lowell High School. And when we got there, it was like nothing like that. You know, the students are full of personality um, and just like, you know, yeah. so much energy dynamic and um, under a lot of pressure. Yeah, I, I was really struck by that documentary because as I was watching it, you had to see the stories of these different students that you're you're kind of following through this process of applying for admissions, and it's it's so it's so competitive, and you see the immense pressure and strain that 
that they face. But one of the things that really struck me was when um, there was kind of a conversation about how Stanford admissions, for example, didn't like Lowell students and didn't admit Lowell students because their perception was that Lowell students were drones or robots or you know that they didn't have personality. And when I when I heard that, it just made me think, you know, how much of that is a result of a stereotype of of Asian Americans, for example, and how does kind of people's perception of race, you know, and and discrimination and stereotypes feed into feed into kind of how things run, right? And I, anyway, I I kind of wonder what your thoughts were about 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 that because the students seem to think it, did their race have to do with with that fact too, right? Yeah, it's, you know, and I'm sure Stanford University would have a counter argument to it. Um, we were really trying to understand the psychology um, of, of why students are, you know, putting themselves through so much stress and, um, you know, the, the risks that they're taking to go to these elite schools. Um, and that's certainly their perception. Um, but I think that we just have had a total lack of representation and so glad that you're spotlighting that this particular thing about telling stories and how important they are. Um, you know, I've written, you know, so many proposals in my decades long career of um, for the films that I've uh, made about how important narratives are storytelling is for our community. And I think now you can see the urgency of it, sadly, all around us and the rise in hate crimes and yeah. Um, you know, it's just like without those narratives that fill in um, the, you know, nuances and all the, you know, the interesting things, the humor yeah. and the, the sub, the sub story, sub, you know, subtext, it's like, then Stanford admissions officers are left with just the, you know, the, the data that doesn't tell the story and gives them the wrong. It's so easy to misinterpret, you know. Yeah, and I think this is an interesting piece because you you've really been a leader in this and I think the world has had to catch up to you in many ways because you know you've been telling and writing proposals as you said about telling the story of our Asian community, Asian American community. Um, but there hasn't always been sort of the appetite to hear those stories, right? And and I and I'm curious to hear what you think about kind of the state of the industry these days, because, you know, we've seen, of course, there was just this big thing around crazy rich Asians and so on. But I mean, it's still our, 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 the, the way that we're seeing ourselves represented in, in Hollywood and other places still isn't really telling the full story of how people are really experiencing their lives, right? Not everybody is this, are that well off, for example, right? Or, you know, or the how the way that um, Asian Americans tend to be objectified or have certain stereotypes that get played over and over again. And I wonder how you think these representations interplay with some of the recent anti-Asian sentiments and violence that you see in our community. And if you have any thoughts about how we might begin to change some of that. Yeah, that's a deep question. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it's funny, crazy, crazy rich Asians, we should there should just be something called crazy normal Asians. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it, it it is a really exciting time, though. You know, joking around aside, that for an Asian American filmmaker, because there's a real market demand, there's a need for our stories, um, and all of us. You know, there, I you know I'm surrounded by a lot of amazing Asian American um, filmmakers, um, and we're we're all, um, you know, whose films everyone should check out too. And, and we're all wondering, is this just going to be a passing phase um, that there's a, a market demand for our work, you know, that you can go to Netflix and there's like the channel that says like, it's AAPI Heritage Month, watch these films. Cause there actually hasn't been much about that. You know, I worked on the Joy Luck Club and it took 25 years yeah. for another narrative like Crazy Rich Asians to come out. Yeah. and. Um, you know, we, there's so many amazing stories that haven't been told about our, you know, today about our history about, you know, the, you know, the, um, you know, all of these, like a lot of these things happened in San Francisco, seminal, um, events that took place that have formed our consciousness as Americans. I always like to say, like, yeah. we don't think about how the Vietnam war has, 
uh, entirely shaped contemporary America, how we think of ourselves as Americans. And, you know, Vietnamese and Southeast Asian Americans in this country are completely invisible, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and yet that is who we are as Americans, not just Asian Americans, but as Americans, you know? Yeah. How, how do you see, I mean, some of the, some of the, the challenges when we start to see the anti-Asian hate, I think, is that it's a, it's a way in which people are either objectifier, objectifying or taking out the humanity in people to think that, that it is okay to direct hate or physical violence and harm to an individual, because in some way they're taking away the humanity and the person behind it, it there, right? And, and so, you know, I really do think that as you kind of are telling the stories through your documentaries, it starts to, to make people real. So people start to identify that some of the struggles that they have faced are similar struggles across different racial lines, including in our Asian American community. And I think that's important because as you mentioned, I feel like some of our community has been, has felt invisible or, or if not invisible, um, oftentimes kind of felt like, you know, we're the model minority. And so therefore you don't need any help or there's no issues or no problems, right? Or that, and if there is a story that is being told, it's this this narrow kind of story about who who our who our community who are we are, and I think that that's really challenging when we start to deal with some of these anti Asian hate that we're seeing out there. Can you what is your thinking about kind of how you know do you think that there is a change in in wanting to hear those stories those kinds of stories? I mean, there's like the fantastical stories of like the crazy rich Asians, which I think has a place also in in. In storytelling, but do you think some of these other kind of more gritty and gritty kind of experiences that people are feeling or are going through have a, have have an, have a market? Well, the you know um, two filmmakers of you know Asian American descent um, were Oscar nominated filmmakers this year. There's Minari, yeah. which is a pretty gritty story. Um, and then and, and Chloe, Chloe Zhao's Nomadland, which is, she's a F Asian American filmmaker. I feel like um, people, this appetite, we need to kind of continue to feed that appetite and, um, and develop it because, you know, uh, you know, taste is subjective and yeah. we like what we know and we don't yeah. know what, what we don't know is like, there's a whole range of things that are out there. Yeah. Um, yeah. I wanted to ask you a little bit more about um, Try Harder. I know that you're working on an impact campaign with some of the students, and I know that's been a really uh, amazing experience that you've gone through. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, um, thank you for asking. We are trying, you know, high school today has really changed. Um, students who are high achieving or have been have become at risk students, like alongside kids that live in poverty, kids in foster care, kids with incarcerated parents, and they're at risk for um, serious mental health issues related to academic pressure. Um, so anxiety, depression. Um, I, I talked to the count, you know, I talked to the wellness center yeah. um, staff at Lowell, and they would say, you know, people look at us as like, like you said, the model minority, like these are the, the smart kids, they don't have any problems. What is, you know, but Lowell High School is like the biggest high school in San Francisco, and 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 they're really, um, like I said, have been identified these kids as having lots of issues, but they don't get the resources because they're, you know, resource. I mean, if, you know, it's sort of like in America, we're all in competition against each other. When we really um, are in community with each other, yeah. um, and and that's kind of what I feel like. When what stories can do is they can show you how we're connected, how we're all human, yeah. how, um, you know, we're all kind of going through the same things. And it's not one one group pitted against the other group. Um, and, um, but for our campaign, we're really trying to bring our, our film Try Harder to students, parents, school counselors, um, communities everywhere. Um, we thought it'd be cool to take it to like tutoring centers, Kumon centers, <laughs> churches, yeah. like anywhere, like once we get out of COVID or even virtually and have these like deep conversations about reducing pressure for high school kids and, and in terms of college, which is so important. Um, and yet, you know, trying to make sure that we're not having this like binary, either you succeed or you fail mindset. 
mm -hmm. that there are choices, you know, um, and that um, di DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion is really yeah. important for high school students, you know, um, to really support ethnic studies in high school so that, um, you know, we know who we are. It really helps to inform the choices that we make so that we can make better choices in life. Yeah. Um, the one of the other documentaries that I mentioned um, that that you had um, put forward before seeking um, Asian female, it made me think a lot about the most recent um, shootings that we saw. And, you know, it, you, I think this was a, a documentary you put together more than like eight years ago, where it's been some time. And so this is something that you covered and it was really talking about, it was talking about kind of the, how Asian women are, are viewed and so on. I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about, about that and what, how you, how you view that in light of today's. Stories. Yeah. I feel it's so disappointing that that film has to come up now because of the Atlanta spa shootings. Um, it's a film about an old, an older, a 60 year old white man who was obsessed with finding a young wife from China. And at first I thought I was going to make a documentary, like an expose about men who have a fetish for Asian women, which is pretty common out here in the Bay area. Um, and I ended up, um, sort of becoming a character in my own film when I thought he was going to, you know, like the last person that I thought would ever find somebody, he found a young woman in China who agreed to marry him over the internet and he brought her here and I filmed their relationship as they were building it from scratch. They didn't know each other. They didn't speak the same language and I had to translate for them because I yeah. learned a little bit of Mandarin in college. I'm like, I'm not a, I'm a terrible <laughs> Chinese speaker, <laughs> um, but it was like a film with lots of twists and turns. And, you know, I really, I actually like humor. So I, I think it's how we get through the toughest things in life. Yeah. Um, and so um, it really was trying to delve into like the stereotypes about Asian women, the objectification, the kind of the way that they're seen as submissive and docile and, um, you know, serving men, um, all of which gets, completely flipped on its head when you meet the woman that he brings over and, and has to have a real relationship with. Um, and, and, you know, like what happened in Atlanta, you know, obviously, and it's coming out, obviously it's a hate crime that it's related to race and it's related to seeing um, Asian women in a certain, through a certain lens um, as objects and not human, you know? Um, yeah. It, yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's, um, it's incredibly, I think it's a, it is a scary time for, I think many, many people in the Asian community, because you, know, you can just imagine, I, I remember when you and I were talking about this earlier, you, you know, we talked about how horrific the, the event must have been, but a comment that you mentioned before that was, can you imagine what their life might have been like before? And what they had to potentially go through if they were objectified or propositioned because of some people's perceptions of who they they may be, um, that actually was a a big kind of aha moment for me. That you know, it's mu it's much more than just kind of that that incident, right? Oh yeah, I mean these are, it's you know this so called racial reckoning that we're going through. I mean I I I don't understand why it has taken us so long. You know, um, and it's, you know, we have a lot of work to do. We're getting, you know, we're, we're, we're making progress. Um, but these are things that all of us have experienced for a really long time. You yeah. Know, I'm not surprised. I grew up in St. Louis, Missouri, which is where Ferguson is. Um, and, you know, all of the things that have happened that have been kind of, um, unearthed and put into the limelight are things that we kind of know really well um when when you're a minority um the kind of things that you know the not good things that happen to you um and so you know violent there's a whole history of violence against asian americans in from the beginning of our first arrival in yeah. the US, um and being like being like the only race that has had legislation saying that you can't you're not allowed to be an American. Um, 
um, you know, even Stanford, Leland Stanford, who Stanford University is named after is, um, you know, if you look at the, the, men, the his mentality around Asian immigrants to, uh, to California, it's appalling. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you can find you can find if you housing in San Francisco is such a big thing. You can find in the bylaws of certain old houses written in, you know, you cannot. This cannot be sold. This house cannot be sold to a person of Asian or it's like they're not allowed. In this house um, today, you can find that. Yeah, Um, I think it's been hi, Debbie and Carmen. This is the cast. Just a heads up that we have about 10 minutes left. The conversation is getting so good, but I just wanted to give you the heads up. Thanks so much. Thanks, Nikesh. And I, I think, Debbie, one of the things that's interesting is that, you know, we, we kind of talk about the fact that this is nothing new, that we've, this is, these are experiences that, and violence has been part of even our history from the very beginning of when Asi- Asian American immigrants came to the United States. And I, and I just wonder from, from your perspective, you know, one of the things that I find I think is has been hard is that even talking about race is really difficult. I think where it's it's so you feel like if you start to talk about race, you're going to step on so many landmines. And um, but at the same time, if you don't try to start talking about the impact of race and how people experience their lives differently, if the way based on how you look, you kind of you just kind of miss it, right? You you don't quite get there in conversation and advancing advancing where we are as a country on, on race and inequality. I, I I totally agree. And you know the good thing though is to have it out in the you know in the conversation to put a name to it. You know, that is like the first step. So even if it is difficult, it is important to have these conversations. Yeah. Yeah. Do you I know that we're kind of wrapping up on time and, and I know you've got a hard stop coming up pretty soon, but I just wonder if you there's any thoughts that you'd want to leave with with our viewers today. We have in our team, we've got a really diverse group of people who are participating over 3000 employees from the GSA general services agency who we're going to be sharing this with as well as our social media networks and so on. Is there anything that you want to leave folks with as as you know, in, in kind of closing our, our Q and a. Yeah, you know, I really think it's important to to um, think about the stories that are um, hidden underneath the data, because those are the connecting points between people and humans. You know, we we all we are you know difference is is real and it's important, um, but we're all connected by this thing that unifies us, which is our humanity. You know, and it. it when you when you understand the motivations and the narratives of the lens that people are looking through, um, it it really helps to understand how we got here, you know, and, and why we're doing the things that we're doing. And you know, I think for like if I if I if I think about the students at Lowell High School that are the subject of Try Harder, and just you know how Lowell High School is a lightning rod of controversy in in San Francisco, um, we have one. Um, group who's in this country historically a minority Asian American Pacific Islanders who at this one high school are not their majority and it's like when you are have systemically historically been invisible um, and you don't have a voice um, there's um, this lack that just exists if you don't fill that in it causes lots of problems, you know, as we can see. Um, and like, we just, we, um, I think we're shifting to a point where um, equity, true equity, Mm -hmm. um, not like equity where like, okay, you're, you can be part of the conversation, but we're still gonna (laughs) take the center stage. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, just because you're like, um, six percent of the population. It doesn't mean that you're any less human than yeah. anyone else. Um, so, yeah, it's an exciting. I think it's a good time. Yeah, and it, those uh, all of those comments kind of really resonate with me. I think I grew up. I grew up uh, in a community that was predominantly Latino, and so I think it was uh, East LA. And so I grew up um, uh, in a high school. I think probably with ninety percent Latino. Maybe the rest of it was every everybody else, right? And it's it's a very different feeling kind of growing up as a super minority 
in communities versus what I experienced coming up here in the Bay Area. And I think that's something that I don't forget when when I kind of think about how how is the country viewing this at large, because it felt very different when I traveled to the East Coast and other places, some parts of the East Coast, I should say. Um, and so it it's it is it is right about wanting to tell the story so that it's so people's you know, the, the deepness of people's thoughts, their hopes, their dreams kind of come out and people can see those connections amongst our different communities. And I feel like our, you know, our community of Asian American Pacific Islanders are really taking bold steps and, you know, we have amazing people like you who are in leadership and, um, you know, asking hard questions and that's, you know, really important for, for, for everyone. Well, I want to thank you for taking the time to to spend with us, and I know your time is so valuable. And I want to wish you all the success in your next documentary, and I hope you'll keep us informed about when that comes out, so that we can share with the group here, and we'll share with everybody about some of the ways in which to access Debbie's uh, other documentaries because they really are worth taking a look at, and I think it'll get uh, you thinking about a lot of the issues that we raised today and uh, amongst conversations with own friends too. So I hope that you'll support Debbie and, and watch some of those documentaries. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to, to John, but thank you again, Debbie, for spending the time with us today. Thank you, Carmen. It was so nice to talk to you. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Debbie and Carmen, for sharing your perspectives and for your candor throughout this conversation. It was truly, truly inspiring. For those who are not able to join us today, we will be sending the link out with a recording of the event to all staff shortly. Thank you again to our racial equity team for organizing this event. For staff within the organization, I'm happy to let you know that our work around racial equity continues to make progress. The Racial Equity Steering Committee has formed and will be supporting efforts going forward. Please stay tuned for opportunities on ways that you can get involved. If you'd like to learn more or reach out, we're sharing contact information on this slide. Again, thank you for joining us today and a happy APA Heritage Month to you all. Thank you.